Good evening. Uh, this is a special episode. I want to focus this episode not so much on ETFs, but on uh, the math and computer science behind Bitcoin itself as a as a result and as a system. And I think it's worth spending a little bit of time on this because I think a lot of people just gloss over what Bitcoin is and what kind of achievement it is. And they don't really understand the, the whole history of how it became to be. And so this episode, I'm going to go into a lot of different things about what what is the core problem and how Satoshi solved this problem. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to look at a uh, I'm going to look at a uh, site that was written by my friend Ben Sigmund called Benobi.1, and in it there's a blog post called Satoshi Soup. So I'm going to open up this post and I'm going to look at this Figma. Okay, so let's zoom back out here and we can sort of get a sense of what we're talking about. So this is this is Bitcoin, which was invented, discovered, if you will, in uh, 2008, and it really really has a number of components to it. That, that make this incredible white paper um, what it is. And so we're going to go over each of these components and find out exactly where it came from, who is responsible for building it. Um, but before I do that, let's just talk a little bit about the problem, right? So the problem is, can I build a form of digital money that has does not rely on any third parties, does not rely on any committees or any uh, adjustable rules. You know, that's the problem, right? So, you know, really there's this problem, building this sort of completely, purely mathematical computer science um, system that is completely independent of any person that the person, the authors can die and the money can live on. This is not even, it wasn't even clear that this was possible to do. Uh, if you go back to, you know, 1980, 1990, it was, it's not clear, right? That this was possible. And it was really solved in 2008. And I think people are going to look back at this discovery as something like the discovery of general relativity or something, something, something that profound because it really is just an amazing, amazing discovery. And yet there's many, many blockchains after that that have been created, but a lot of them, all of them really are, they're, they're constructs where there's always some committee, there's some rules that are being changed. It's not, it doesn't have the mathematical beauty that Bitcoin has. And so how, how did this thing happen and what are the, what are the ingredients of it? So if we look here at the ingredients of Bitcoin, really there's, there's a bunch of them. There's the first thing is there's this notion of public keys and private keys. Now that's a very old, um, very old concept in cryptography. It dates from the 1970s actually. And, uh, but, we have to understand there's this idea of just there's a public key and there's a matching private key. And those are, those are, you can show the public key, but you can't use that in any way to guess the private key. Uh, that's, that's something that that's been known since the the seventies really. And that's part of, um, that's part of the equation, right? So we're going to talk about that. Then the next thing is this idea of blocks of transactions that are produced at regular intervals. Well, we'll see that that's a completely new idea that Satoshi came up with. Then there's the question of how do we determine if a transaction is valid or not? And that's this Nakamoto consensus. Again, a completely new idea of Satoshi. Uh, there's also the idea of voluntary transaction fees, another brilliant idea that, that was completely new to Satoshi. Then there's the actual encryption methodology itself, the SHA-256 encryption. Well, that we owe to the NSA. Um, then there's this idea of this 
public ledger of distributed transactions. Uh, and, you know, that idea of a public ledger, we're going to show that that actually really came from B money, from Weidai, okay? And then there's this P2P network um, that I can send anybody uh, a transaction and the transactions are pseudonymous, like you know there's an address you know that send it to, but you do not know the identity of the person. Um, there's this idea of proof of work that, uh, that we'll, we'll trace back to, you know, Cynthia Dwork originally, and then Adam Back, and then uh, Hal Finney. Uh, and then there's the, this idea of the dynamic difficulty, uh, the difficulty adjustment. So uh, that's, that's a, completely a Satoshi idea. Um, there's the, the, probably the biggest idea of Bitcoin itself, which is the fact that the, the number of coins are finite. That, that's a Satoshi idea. Um, then there's the idea of mining rewards. That, that idea we can trace to Nick Sabo. The idea of no trusted third parties, Nick Sabo. And the idea of uh, sort of smart contracts or the ability of scripting all this stuff, which is completely Nick Sabo. So let's start with the, the real origins here. And as I said before, you know, I would say cryptography really is a, a sort of a 1970s type thing with Diffield and Hemi, uh, uh, Diffield, Diffie Hellman uh, uh, in the 70s. Um, Diffie, I believe, went to Cornell, uh, where I went to undergrad. And I've met him, actually. Or, or I think it's Diffie or I meet Hellman. I'm not sure which one I met. Um, but, yeah, I did math at Cornell. And, uh, and, and then I did graduate uh, work at Stanford. But, um, but Diffie came from Cornell. And, uh, and, and then we had Merkel, who created these Merkel trees. And that all was 1980, okay? So this idea of Merkle trees, we have public-private key cryptography. We also have time stamping that starts getting uh, um, established at this point. Um, and, you know, all this requires uh, sort of a framework to understand how secure this is. And, you know, there's this... Uh, this book by Feller, which I happen to have and I used at Stanford. It is the pretty much the graduate text in probability, the reference, uh, Feller, uh, volume two. Really very interesting book. Now, in 1992, right, that's when Cynthia Dwork and Moni Noor um, quick came up with this idea of spam prevention using an idea they call proof of work, which is you got to do a little bit of computation in order to pass the test. Now, this was just a theoretical paper. Cynthia was at um, IBM Research at this time. And I knew Cynthia. I know Cynthia um, because her husband worked for me at the time. So her husband, David Fuchs, um, also went to Stanford, and actually David and I share a um, uh, an acquaintance that, which who is Donald Knuth. So Donald Knuth, who wrote the Art of Computer Science, the Art of Computer Programming, the three volume set at Stanford, was a professor at Stanford, was on my thesis committee, and Knuth was also the author of Tech, which later became LaTeX. And latex and uh, and Cynthia's husband David was working with Knuth on uh, latex on tech at the time, right? So, anyways, this was just a paper for spam prevention. Never really went anywhere. I discussed it many times with Cynthia, and I had no idea that this thing would ever go anywhere. Um, but in a couple of years later, about five years later. Adam Back created this, really built it into a proof-of-work system for preventing spam email. Um, and Adam is referenced in Satoshi's white paper. 
So already this is this is a significant kind of invention now, and it, it's an absolutely necessary to use this proof of work as we're going to see. Um, now at the same time we have the NSA uh, has created in '93 shot one. Okay. And this is being used in 1998 by Wei Dai for a paper called B Money. So this is a way to a very prototypical um, version of Bitcoin. Nothing like Bitcoin really, but has this idea of broadcasting transactions, has this idea of sending money from A to B, um, and this this is sort of a kind of a ancestor to Bitcoin, right? Now, Hashcash, okay, came up with a couple of different interesting things. They came up with uh, the nonce idea for proof of work. So you, you've got this nonce, you got to find a uh, solution to this uh, to this cryptographic puzzle, right? And this becomes um, eventually what uh, Hal Finney terms RPOW. And this is actual code, right? This is Hal Finney did write this code. So this is a system called RPOW, Reusable Proof of Work. And he is working with and knows Nick Sabo. Nick Sabo has created this idea of bit gold, creates smart contracts, and creates really the idea of solving a puzzle, getting a reward, which then brings us to mining rewards, right? So by the time, by 2005, right? Okay, by, sorry, by, by 2007, right? We already have this idea of broadcasting things on networks. We have the idea of peer-to-peer -peer transactions. This is established. Right, we have the idea of a mining reward, but we don't have this idea of finite currencies. Right, uh, we also have this key concept that's emerging from Nick, which is you should not trust in any third party. And Nick makes the comment here: the problem. Let's look at this quote; it's very important. The problem, in a nutshell, is that our money depends on trust in a third party for its value. As many inflationary and hyperinflationary episodes during the 20th century demonstrated, this is not an ideal set of affairs. Okay, this is a really important quote from 2005. Okay, so now, now, we go to how all this stuff plays in with Satoshi's discovery. Now, this is this was the master stroke, right? The master stroke is, first of all, say, okay, we have got the system, but we have to stop the fact that computers are going to get smarter, better, and better. And there's going to be more and more of them solving these proof-of-work problems. So how do we solve this? Well, we're going to do a dynamic difficulty reduction. Okay, So we're going to estimate the hash rate. We're going to make the puzzles harder every two weeks based on the hash rate. Okay. And if we do that, right, we can have a finite amount of coins. Now, this is really the, the, the fundamental breakthrough because all of a sudden now we're saying money is a finite number. And you can have a small part of that finite number, but this has to be non-inflationary by default, right? Now, there's other big, big decisions here, right? which is, okay, now we've got this idea of a finite amount of money. We've got the idea that the difficulty is going to be adjusting. But we also now have to have this idea of mining rewards, right? And we have to cut the mining rewards. Now, we could cut them progressively or we could cut them once every four years. Not really every four years, but once every uh, four block years. Um and we cut them in half. And so now we get a sum of uh, you know, 1 over 2 to the n, and that is a converging series, which this is converging to 21 million coins. So we now have mining rewards with the halvening, the dynamic difficulty adjustment, and we now have a system 
that allows us to have um, a finite total amount of coins. Okay. We also have this idea of uh, the blocks are pretty much tied to make it every 10 minutes, right? And so this is part of the dynamic difficulty adjustment is that we have this idea of regular scheduled emission of blocks. And now for the double spend, we have now this very simple rule, which is longest chain wins. And Satoshi basically proves that as long as you don't have 51% of the blockchain, your economic interest is going to be to respect this longest chain um, rule. So it doesn't depend on anything else except everybody's interest, self-interest. And he can prove, and I, I have gone through the numbers, and I'll put my link in the thing, that actually this is done, this math, it, it becomes this Poisson uh, distribution, and you can solve for it, and you can prove very quickly that you have exponential hardening uh, on this. So that's... That's what Satoshi did. And that, to me, is just, you know, he put all these pieces together. He built a couple of the missing pieces. He put it all together in one in one uh, system. And so, yeah. So that's the best way I can describe the history of um, Bitcoin. And the great thing, the you know, it, there have been some changes to Bitcoin, but overall, it's really the same. It's really the same thing that it was initially. It's not. It's not. The delta is small, right? Now there's been different things. There's tap roots and blah blah blah. Segwit, um, but. You know, the core part of Bitcoin has not changed in 15 years, which is just remarkable. And, you know, we're, we're up to about a trillion dollars in market cap. Um, it's processing as much transactions um, in terms of dollars, you know, as Visa, uh, not in terms of transactions. But it, it really has lived up to its, um, to its spec. And I'm not even sure Satoshi would have believed that it could be this successful. But it's been an amazing, amazing ride. So I hope you've enjoyed my little presentation. If there's any inaccuracies, it's possible. I'm not not a perfect historian of this. But uh, I say either bring it to me or bring it to the author of this paper, Ben Sigmund, who's my close friend. Um, we're both very interested in rectifying or contributing to this uh, narrative on the origins of Bitcoin. And uh, I thank you for your, your time. And we'll get back to the regular uh, uh, ETF programming uh, next video. All right. Thanks.